Okay, today's lecture is going to be a two-part uh, investigation of parental care. And one of the initial parental investments uh, seen in birds is a determination of how many eggs are going to be laid. And so this is called the clutch size. Um, that's the number of eggs uh, put into a nesting attempt. And this can vary within a species um, geographically, and we'll talk about some uh, geographic trends associated with that. Um, it varies with regard to um, natural selection relative to the optimal clutch size based upon predation threats, develop, de developmental modes, uh, the foraging ecology of the species, uh, and their life spans. Um, we'll, we'll talk some more about these aspects and how natural selection has led to uh, different optimal clutch sizes for different species depending on their life histories when we talk specifically about life histories in birds. There are a couple of terms that are used in ornithology to describe laying patterns in birds. Some birds are said to be determinate um, layers. And this is the less common of the two, uh, determinate versus indeterminate. Determinate layers lay a set number of eggs, meaning uh, if you remove one of the eggs from their clutch, uh, they don't replace it. So charade reforms, for example, lay four egg clutches. If you remove one of those eggs, then they're just left with a three egg clutch. Now contrast that to uh, something like this northern flicker, which is an indeterminate layer, and this is what most birds are. This means that if, if a predator uh, takes one of the eggs out of their nest so that there's partial nest predation, they will replace that with a, a, a nest with another egg until they get to the clutch size that's appropriate uh, for that species for that nesting attempt. And at least they'll do that until they just physically can't do it anymore if they don't have enough resources to produce eggs and so forth. Um, but this can be pretty extreme. So in one study where they continually took out uh, one egg from a northern flicker nest, this one female was able to lay 71 eggs in 73 days before she stopped trying to complete that uh, artificially reduced clutch. So we, we talk about determinate versus indeterminate layers, but realize these categories are not set in stone and it, it really uh, depends on the ecology and, and kind of how capable a species might be able to uh, replace uh, eggs in the nest. And there could be even variation within a species with regard to this potential. So um, these terms really are not used too much today, uh, but, but they are terms that you might run across in the literature, so I wanted you to know uh, what they mean. All right, so when do you lay eggs? And what I mean by this, we've already talked a little bit about the seasonality of, of reproductive effort in birds, but more on a, a circadian rhythm. Uh, and most birds tend to lay early in the morning, uh, pre-dawn or right around dawn time. And they lay in one to two day intervals for most birds. For larger birds, um, it takes longer to produce those eggs, and so there is a, a longer interval in between eggs uh, when they lay. Um, we've already talked about the energetic expenditures associated with the three kind of main uh, uh, events in the uh, annual cycle of a bird, so uh, molt, migration, um, and reproduction. And reproduction takes energy demands for sure, but also requires uh, a good degree of extra nutrients uh, and, and minerals. Um, so in, in the case of females, they have to get a lot more calcium in their diet before besides what they just need for basic maintenance uh, to produce those um, egg shells themselves. And so they will increase food items that have uh, high calcium in their diet, including eating things like um, teeth that they find, any bones, snails, any kind of um, calcareous rock. Um, so some of you that who have maybe raised parrots or, or birds in captivity knows that one of the, the supplements you can add are cuttlefish bones which are high, um, these cephalopod uh, pens basically, um, have high concentrations of calcium and that's a, a cheap, easy way to supplement their diet uh, during reproduction. Okay, two more terms associated with laying patterns in birds are income versus capital nesters or, or income versus capital layers. Income nesters, they um, derive the nutrients and minerals that they need um, 
for production of eggs and then also uh, for incubation um, by foraging. Okay, so they they are reliant on taking breaks from incubation to um, go um, replenish their stores so that they have enough food. Or if they are stuck incubating the eggs, their mate delivers the food to them. And so this is another important reason why a lot of birds are monogamous. However, some birds are what we call capital nesters. These individuals rely on fat reserves to keep them alive while they're incubating. Um, so snow goose, for example, the figure on the right here uh, is an example of a capital nester. The circles uh, indicate uh, a rival mass of individuals that arrive with different um, body masses. And you see, let me get the pen going here, individuals that arrive at a very high mass, um, they lay large clutches. So they can lay six eggs, but by producing that many eggs, it really reduces their weight so that by the time they get to the laying date, uh, their mass has dropped to this level right here. And notice that's pretty much where all of them are. So that means if you arrive at a slightly smaller mass, you can't produce five, six eggs, you can only produce five eggs that will get you again down to that um, mass that is going to be enough to sustain you during incubation because at late incubation, look where all of these birds are. Okay, so they're all way down here. And if they go much lower than that, the nest is gonna fail and the reason for that is they will just abandon it for self-preservation. They like, oh, if I can stay anymore, I just I'm going to starve to death, um, and that's that's right here. So at that point right there, they'll they'll basically abandon the nest, uh, and the nest will fail. So it doesn't make any sense for a bird if it arrives at that weight to try and lay um, five or six eggs. That is a very loud Carolina wren. Sorry. Um, it doesn't make sense for a bird at that weight to try to, to lay five or six eggs because that would put its laying mass way down here and that would mean it would really quickly during the incubation phase when it's trying to take care of itself would uh, drop below the fail and uh, put itself close to, to dying um, of starvation. So capital nesters are just relying on fat stores to fuel themselves during this incubation period and so that really has a, a big impact on the clutch size that they can produce. Okay, once the eggs are laid, then birds have to incubate their eggs. So uh, all birds, with very few exceptions, have to transfer body heat to the eggs to stimulate development of the eggs. The, the key exception to that are the mound builders we talked about earlier, um, uh, last week. Um, we talked about the fact that they use rotting vegetation or volcanic soils to provide that uh, heat to um, uh, get the eggs to develop. Cuckoos can actually jumpstart the developmental process inside of their bodies before they lay their eggs. And remember, cuckoos are one of these examples of a brood parasite. Um, this is, I'm talking about European cuckoos. They're brood parasites, and so they lay their eggs into the nest of other species. And this is actually a, a way to give their developing young a developmental edge and maybe develop a little faster and um, hatch a little sooner so they can outcompete their their host nestlings. We'll talk a, a bit more about that um, next week. Interesting point of interest. I uh, I'm looking right now at my very first indigo bunting of the season at my feeder. So uh, hopefully you're getting out there and you're seeing new birds. Don't rely on just the birds that we've been seeing all winter because those are going to start disappearing. You're going to be seeing and hearing new birds. So really use Merlin to try to help you identify those birds. Okay, back to the lecture. Um, incubation gives challenges to the individual that's incubating because they have to trade off, like we just talked about with the capital nesters, particularly with them. Um, you have to trade off between self-preservation and self-maintenance and staying on the eggs long enough to keep them within a narrow temperature range to uh, guarantee that they're going to hatch and continue to have uh, sustained development. Now, some of the proximate mechanisms associated with incubation behavior is a rise in a 
uh, hormone called prolactin. So prolactin sh shoots up uh, right at the beginning or just before incubation is to start and it's associated with in females a decrease in luteinizing hormone and a decrease in uh, progesterone. In males the, you see the same kind of trend with an increase, well at least in species where the males do provide some incubation and we'll talk about how that varies from species to species. But if the males are going to be providing parental care which includes incubation then they show a rapid decrease in testosterone and a, a huge increase in prolactin. These apparently are, are hormones that are antagonistic and you can't have high levels of both of them at the same time. One of the things that uh, prolactin increases and estrogen increases will cause is the formation of what's called an incubation patch or a brood patch. This is associated with a loss of feathers um, on the uh, breast and belly uh, and also with uh, the tissues associated with these areas becoming highly vascularized so there's a gr much greater increase of uh, blood flow to these areas and it swells with this fluid and it's amazingly hot. I mean it feels like a heating pad. You catch a bird with a, a big brood patch and you can literally feel the heat radiating off of these brood patches. And if you blow on their bellies you'll see things like this, this, this really stark area where the feathers have either fallen out, and some birds actually do pluck the feathers to, to get the brood patch going. Um, but this is something that is just an adaptation to increase the efficiency of transferring the heat from the body to the eggs themselves. In a lot of cases, it is just a big solid patch like this. Some birds, though, do have individual little brood patches that fit individual um, eggs. Now birds can regulate the amount of blood going to the brood patch so they increase the amount of blood while they're uh, um, incubating uh, but if they have if there are species where males and females say for example take turns incubating when it's not your shift you can actually reduce the blood flow to those areas to reduce the amount of heat loss that you would experience. Other characteristics of the brood patch is the epidermis does become thicker, basically kind of a calloused-like um, uh, feel to it. This is just to help to re resist abrasions uh, with continual contact with the egg. Interestingly, so we're, we're about to talk about who actually incubates, and it varies from species to species. In some species, it's a single sex that incubates. Typically, if that's the case, it's going to be females. But if it's, a, say, a monogamous species and the female dies due to predation or some other reason um, in the middle or maybe late at the incubation phase, the male can then uh, develop a brood patch in that emergency situation and will adopt that behavior. Less likely to do that if it's uh, very early in the egg laying uh, session or incubation has just started because there's not a lot invested in that, that nest already, so it's more likely that the male... Uh, or the single surviving parent would, would bail on that uh, nesting attempt if they have the chance to remate again uh, and start from scratch. But if it's almost ready to hatch anyway, you wouldn't want to give up on that and, and you'd want to uh, try to continue that. And so in those circumstances, they can develop a brood patch. Okay, so let's get to this. Who does incubate? Um, this pie chart shows you across species the patterns, and about half of birds both males and females will share incubation and they will do it in shifts that vary in some um, you know one individual will incubate for an hour or two and then they'll switch uh, others do more like uh, um, diurnal a diurnal shift and a night shift so woodpeckers do that so females will incubate during the day males incubate at night in um, some birds, like pelagic large seabirds, penguins, um, one individual, one sex could incubate for a very long period of time, for days, uh, if not weeks, while the other is out uh, foraging to bring back food um, to, feed the, to feed the young and the, uh, sometimes the incubating parent, uh, and then they may shift at that point. So the, the shifts can vary. But again, shared incubation is the most common pattern, the second most common, if only one sex does it, 
it's the female. And this shouldn't be surprising when we talk about sexual selection. The females just have a uh, more heavy initial investment in the eggs themselves, so it kind of makes sense that they would um, be more likely to take on this duty. In situations with female-only incubation, though, um, they either have to take brief shifts away from incubating to go feed, but that would cause the temperature to, to uh, decrease and could uh, hurt the development of the eggs. And so what typically happens is the males will bring food to the incubating uh, female um, while she's incubating. And it's, it's basically like he's already shifted to parental care behavior and he's like when he's going to be bringing food to the nestlings, he's just starting it early to by bringing them to his mate. Um, if the another kind of trade-off that could be associated with this, if the female does leave to go feed on her own, uh, the males, even if they don't, they will at least hang around the nest and kind of guard it against potential predators. Oh, uh, talking about the the feeding of the uh, incubating female. Remember, we talked about the hornbill and the female seals themselves up in these cavities and are totally reliant on um, the male uh, bringing uh, food to them because they just can't leave because they've sealed themselves in. Male-only incubation, in contrast to female-only incubation, is pretty rare. Um, so that's the 6.1% here. None? Well, that's a little misleading because uh, all avian eggs have to get some source of heat to begin development. Mound builders, they don't do it physically themselves, so they don't incubate, but they make those incubating structures the mounds. And obligate brood parasites, while they don't incubate their own eggs, remember what a brood parasite is, is it's, a, it's an individual that lays its eggs into the nest of another individual. Well, that host individual is providing the incubation um, uh, services in, in those situations. So it's not really a none situation, but that's uh, how this, this graph shows it. But that's, that's what they mean, that, that the individual parent doesn't provide direct body heat themselves. So when do you start that uh, energy transfer, that heat transfer to stimulate development? There's two different patterns. The most common pattern is um, so that after the clutch is complete or almost complete, there, there may be one egg that is still going to be laid, and so you may start incubating um, when the penultimate egg is laid, so the um, um, N-1 egg. This results in relatively synchronous hatching of young. So like in this picture on the left, all of those nestlings hatched within just a few hours of each other, and so they tend to be about the same size. Um, they, they started at the uh, starting line at the same time, and they show uh, relatively uh, similar uh, developmental patterns. Other species, however, will begin immediately after the first egg is laid. Okay, well, what that results in is that first egg has got a head start on all of its siblings, and so it's going to hatch first, and it's going to begin developing while the others are still incubating, and it leads to what's called asynchronous hatching and a huge discrepancy in the size of the siblings associated with the nest. And so you can tell this individual hatched first, this individual hatched uh, several days afterwards. And this has important consequences to the ability of the parents to make a clean break from incubating to feeding the young, um, and it also influences the likelihood that all of the nestlings are going to survive and uh, how much competition there's going to be for food and whether that competition is, is kind of fairly distributed among individuals or not. So we'll, we'll talk about that. How long does it take for these eggs basically to cook? Uh, and, and the developing embryos develop before they hatch, it can be as short as 10 days. Um, in some relatively small passerines, uh, brown-headed cowbirds would fit in that category. They have incredibly fast uh, development, and 10 days from an egg being laid and um, incubated, it, it, it can hatch 10 days later. Larger birds tend to take longer, and so they can take you know, up to uh, about three months. This is particularly true associated with the larger precocial eggs because remember, when those young hatch, precocial means that they're already well-developed, mentally um, advanced, 
Um, and so that takes longer in the egg to, to get to that better developmental stage. If you hatch at 10 days, boy, you're going to be just this very altricial, um, helpless kind of gummy um, uh, nestling. So why this variation? Again, we'll talk a little bit about this when we talk about life history strage, stage, uh, uh, strategies in birds. Um, but nest predation plays a strong role in providing a selection pressure for uh, leading to a faster developmental rate or kind of making that less of an issue. So for example, an open cup nesting species like an American robin um, is going to have more predation pressures. We talked about the, the difference between predation pressures on open cup nesting species and cavity nesters. Open cup nesting species are more prone to predation, so if you're going to lay your eggs, boy, you want to lay your eggs quickly, get them to hatch, and, and let them, the sooner they can hatch, the sooner you as a parent can start bringing them lots and lots of food to speed up their development. So there's a lot of hurry up and let's get this over with. Uh, with high predation rates. If you're a cavity nesting species though, there's less predation pressure and so there tends to be larger clutches um, and the uh, developmental time in the egg is longer before they hatch and the parents uh, begin uh, the feeding process. And uh, so for example, these are the example I'm using here, something like an American robin and in the same family the uh, eastern bluebirds uh, would show pretty different uh, developmental times uh, primarily due to these different predation threats of cavity versus open cup nesting uh, strategies. Temperature wise the optimum for most birds is uh, 37 to 38 degrees Celsius so a high 90s to uh, low 100. Um, if it gets below, if, if incubation starts, development is going, and the egg drops below 78.8, that's pretty much going to be lethal. So that will uh, kill the developing embryo. And the same thing if it goes above 104.9. And remember that 104, that's kind of the low end of the internal body temperature in most birds. So they can go, you know, 104 to 112 a degree basal um, uh, with basal metabolic rate their temperature and we talked about how this might be one of the limiting factors that explains why all birds are oviparous so there are no viviparous species of birds probably due to these temperature limitations so you don't want to let your eggs get too cold you don't want to get them too hot um, if you are living if you're trying to raise your young in a very um, hot sunny environment shading is very important or wetting the eggs by wetting your breast feathers and then dabbing them over the eggs so that they get some nice um, uh, radiant cooling um, especially if it's uh, a dry area not a lot of humidity and very windy that um, um, cooling process is going to be very effective uh, by evaporative cooling so this is seen uh, in uh, seabird colonies, the shading, and in desert species, that, that wetting of, of the eggs with the evaporative cooling. Now, depending on how harsh the environment is, it will affect these species, the, the incubator, their ability to uh, leave the nest to take care of themselves um, if they are uh, uh, resource-based layers. Um, so this figure here is showing you that that at high temperatures at, at relatively high temperatures you can leave the nest for a fairly good period of time and they're not going to uh, lose too much heat and so uh, the time in an incubating session will actually drop and the time of a recess will actually be increased as it gets colder and colder though you can't stay away from the nest very long and that means you better stay on those eggs for a much longer period of time and so this will depend that the outside temperature could uh, be associated with um, how flexible um, the incubating individual can be in leaving the nest for what period of time. Eggs have to be turned in uh, most species. There are a few exceptions to this we'll talk about. 
The importance of this is one, it equalizes the temperature among the eggs so that it maintains uh, equal developmental rates. Uh, but probably the most important thing is it prevents that chorioelantois from adhering to the eggshell uh, early in development. Remember the chorioelantois grows as the, the uh, embryo grows because it serves as a storage sac for waste, but it's also highly vascularized and so it serves as the gas exchange structure. If that adheres to the inside of the egg, it can dry out and uh, a dry respiratory surface just doesn't work at all. And so w rotating the egg keeps that adherence uh, from, from happening. Now, the two species that I know of that don't turn their eggs and how they can get away with that uh, makes sense. One uh, are the mound builders, right? So the mound builders can't turn their eggs because they're buried, um, but probably the way they can get away with that is not only in those mounds is it nice and warm because of the decomposition process of the vegetation or the volcanic soils, but there's high humidity, and so the eggs are not going to dry out, and that Coriolantois isn't going to dry out. Second species are um, palm swifts, that they actually glue their eggs in nests that are glued on the underside of, of palm fronds, and those palm fronds are constantly in the wind moving back and forth, and just that movement itself. Uh, will prevent that Coriolantois from sticking. One of the things that birds will do, the, the em developing embryos, before they actually hatch, they'll begin peeping. They'll, they'll do some um, vocalizations. And there's indication that this is communication between the developing embryos and the different eggs. So the older chicks, if they're... Um, getting ready to hatch, they will signal to their younger siblings, hey, you better speed up so that we can hatch about the same time. And the younger chicks, depending on their capability of doing that, will say, no, nope, you better slow down. So it's a, it's a way that they can both communicate in a way to greater lead to greater synchronization of their, their hatching. And that makes sense if the nestlings are full siblings, because if if you can survive and at the same time increase the chance that a close relative is going to survive, boy, you're passing on lots of copies of your genes, right? So a full sibling has 50% of your genes, so it's in their best, your best interest to make sure that, that they have a, a greater chance of surviving. I've always thought that a cool study would be to look at species that have very high rates of extra pair copulation such that a lot of the nestlings in a nest are not full sibs, you would expect to be less of this communication because in that situation, you know, you may have an individual that you're uh, less related to, maybe a half sibling, or potentially not related to at all. And there shouldn't be this type of communication. There actually should be more competition to, to you know, do what else, whatever's in your best interest. All right, so before they actually hatch, though, um, birds typically will break through the blunt end of the egg, the membrane, uh, and breathe air in this um, uh, blunt end of the, the egg uh, before hatching. And the hatching process itself involves two structures that are fairly transient uh, morphological structures in a bird's life. The first is the egg tooth, uh, shown on the, the upper mandible here. What this does is it allows the birds to just gradually be tapping on the eggshell by, by you know, kind of upward thrust of the bill um, onto the inside of that shell to weaken it. And by concentrating the force of those blows into this spiky area, um, it makes it much more efficient. So it's like, you know, think about if someone steps on you wearing um, shoes that have a broad heel versus high heels, the high heel is going to hurt much worse. It concentrates that force uh, to make it, I mean, much more forceful. And the same thing, that's what the, the idea of having this egg tooth is. But this is a transient feature. It's just used for that purchase purpose of, of hatching. And as soon as a, a bird hatches, a few days later, that basically sloughs off. To increase the efficiency of the egg tooth, though, there's a hatching muscle. 
um, on the dorsal uh, or, uh, part of the neck, uh, back of the head, kind of in the um, mantle region, well, above, between the mantle region, uh, no, sorry, the nape region, under that plumage region is where you would see this. And um, again, that just gives you a little extra power for, for getting that uh, egg tooth and making contact with the inside of the egg. And once you're hatched again, you don't need it, and so it atrophies shortly after hatching. Now, once the birds have, have hatched, uh, there's the question of what to do with the eggshells. In some cases, the adults will take the eggshells away from the nest. Um, in other cases, they'll actually eat them. In both cases, um, they serve to help preserve the camouf camouflage of the nest, um, both visually and if there could be any scent associated with the fluids associated with the uh, uh, eggshell membranes. You want to get that away from the nest. Um, but also, if you're eating them, it actually can help the female recoup uh, calcium stores if she is going to be um, maybe perhaps having a second clutch of eggs and, and needs those calcium, that calcium to produce uh, more eggs. All right, let's talk more about this altricial and precocial spectrum. I've mentioned it vaguely a couple of times, and we mentioned, for example, like the mound builders were super precocial. Um, if you just break it up into two categories, the bird here on the left is altricial, the bird on the right is precocial. Uh, and so notice the developmental differences between them. If you look at a, a graph that kind of shows, or a table that shows you what these differences are, altricial young are born with closed eyes, uh, precocial open, um, they're naked, they don't have uh, any uh, down feathers, or very sparse. Uh, precocial young have a nice coat of down. Altricial young are completely immobile. The only thing they can really do is lift their head up and beg for food. And even that, their necks are kind of wobbling around and they don't have a lot of muscular development. Precocial young, pretty much good to go. They hatch and they're running around. So for altricial young, they really are helpless. And so it, parental care is essential. Uh, minimal parental care in the case of precocial uh, young usually no feeding they're self-feeding so the type of parental care we'll talk about could in include things just like protection against predators uh, teaching them appropriate food sources but they feed themselves but altricial young they have to be fed by the parents so to get to that precocial stage again you're going to have a uh, longer incubation period and a larger egg with a much larger yolk to fuel the longer term development of a larger individual. They tend to have larger brains uh, also com compared to altricial young uh, during development. And um, they're, once they hatch though, some interesting things switch. So if you look at altricial young, they have a huge intestinal tract compared to the small intestines of a precocial young. That's because the altricial young are born at such an underdeveloped stage, they have to really develop rapidly once they hatch, and that means mom and dad are bringing them tons and tons of food, and they have to have an efficient system of processing that food, so they have a, must have a larger intestinal tract uh, to uh, absorb those nutrients to maintain a really high developmental rate. Compared to precocial, which they've already completed most of their development, right? So they don't have to have that super fast re, uh, developmental rate. So again, faster developmental rate, three to four times that of the precocial species in altricial species. So make sure that you know these, these key differences between altricial and precocial young. I also wanted to point out that there is, in some of the older literature, the use of terms nidiculous and nidifugus. Sounds like some, some um, spell from Harry Potter, but actually it translates, nitty refers to nest, colis means loving, Fugus means leaving, so nidiculus means nest loving. Nidifugus means nest leaving. So a nidiculus lung is basically the same thing as an altricial young. Uh, they have to stay in the nest uh, to maintain development. Nidifugus young, they pretty much are good to go, right? So as soon as they hatch, they can just immediately leave the nest. So that's more associated with precocial young. All right, so I've been talking about this um, precocial and altricial, but realize it's these are kind of uh, 
breaking it down binary into something that's really more continuous. And so some people have actually come up with a finer categorization of these terms uh, going from either than super precocial, like the mound builders we talked about, to altricial. Do not memorize this. Okay, I just want you to know that it's not as clean cut as just precocial and, and um, altricial. There is a, a kind of a gradient uh, between these. Uh, and, and that gradient includes like, you know, how much down, what, what are your sight capabilities, are you born with the eyes open or not, mobility, parental nourishment, parental attendance. So, you know, the, the combinations of these things can vary a, along this spectrum. So let me give you some examples of, of birds that fit each of these. We've already talked about super precocial mound builders. Altricial young, they pretty much look like these gummies. Not very mobile, uh, well, immobile, except for the neck. Um, blind, completely naked or almost, so like this cedar waxwing. Um, here we have hummingbird, also altricial. You can see how underdeveloped they are. Maybe little tufts of down, but certainly not enough to provide any initial thermal regulatory capabilities. But now we've got a semi-altricial uh, bittern here. And it's got a, a greater capability of, of a little bit of thermal regulation. Not much, but it does have more down. Eyes are open, definitely more developed and more mobile capable, but not, not fully mobile. Here's a little bit more down, uh, more thermal regulatory capabilities, eyes again open, more mobile. So this is a storm petrel, semi-precocious. But then precocious is like this wimbrel. Man, this bird's pretty much good to go. And once it hatches, uh, it, it can go find food on its, its own. Much greater uh, thermal capabilities, not complete, but uh, better than the previous classes of birds I mentioned. All right, so um, how did this evolve in birds, this variation? Phylogenetic studies indicate that ancestral birds likely were precocial. Um, if you look at basal bird lineages, they are precocial. They show precocial patterns of development. And fossil patterns looking at um, non-avian dinosaurs uh, indicate that, that those eggs were also associated with precocial young. And interestingly, uh, it shows that there may have been some incubation in some of these dinosaurs, um, or at least some degree of, of brood care that may have been more male care than uh, female care, which is relatively rare in birds. But if you actually look at where those birds are that provide um, male incubation patterns solely, it, it is oftentimes associated with some of those basal lineages of birds. So clearly with altricial young you need to have more parental care and um, that's one of the key links to monogamy, social monogamy and the, the need to buy parental care. We talked about that previously. It just takes two birds to uh, bring enough food uh, for the developing young. Uh, because they're developing so quickly in that context, uh, you got to bring a lot of food. Differences in thermal regulatory abilities, precocial young, again, they do have greater partial homeothermy. They still do need some brooding by their parents uh, early on, but within one week, they're pretty much 90% thermally uh, efficient uh, relative to the adults. Altricial species, though, they have to brood the young. So here's a here's a, a, a switch in terms I'm using. When we're talking about providing heat to the eggs, we call that incubation. If you're providing heat to recently hatched young or juveniles, we call that brooding. So sitting on eggs, incubation, transferring heat to young, that's brooding. So brooding is crucial uh, in altricial species. But as the young rapidly develop, rapidly develop, they're getting uh, feathers, uh, they're natal down, uh, but they're also growing much bigger muscles that uh, can be used to generate heat. And so they do show increased capabilities of uh, homeothermy uh, as they um, get older. Um, so that's basically what you're seeing here with this figure. Um, as a bird gets older, its uh, loss of body temperature drops, so it's becoming more uh, thermally uh, capable uh, as a single nestling. But 
because these you're typically raised with your, your with your nestlings that actually also helps the the huddling uh, in the brood uh, also helps them collectively keep their body temperature so that individually they may not be thermally capable but as a group by snuggling together that minimizes the heat loss okay so i've mentioned that altricial young really grow quickly and that that is true but depending on their foraging ecology they do grow at at slightly different rates and um, fledge at different target weights. So you generally have the sigmoidal uh, uh, growth pattern um, to the point where you're reaching adult weight. So this American cliff swallow starts off a little slow, but then it rapidly increases until they actually exceed the weight of the adults. And then they're continuing to grow here. So a cliff swallow when they fledge, they're actually heavier than the adults. That's what I think is always kind of funny when people tell me, they say, oh, I saw a baby bird. And I said, well, how, how can you tell? Oh, it was so much smaller. Well, you know, in some cases, the young fledge actually at a higher mass. And in a lot of cases, uh, they probably more typical, um, they're, they're the same size, uh, at least mass wise, as the, the parent. So as indicated by the cedar waxwing here. But this is a fruit eater, right? So this is going to be key here in a minute. A fruit eater um, going also perhaps gleaning insects here, but it's, it's an arboreal species, right? So a tree species. Here we have a, a ground feeder, curve-bill thrashers. See, what they do is they have slower growth and they actually fledge significantly smaller. These really do smaller than the parents. And that's because it's easier to, to forage as a ground feeder without having flight capabilities. Uh, and so flight capability is oftentimes associated with mass. You've got to have those big pectoralis muscles, for example, to have efficient flight. If you're going to be a juvenile cliff swallow, you got to learn how to catch those insects really quickly. Um, so you better uh, forage, uh, you better fledge at a relatively high weight because you're not going to be very good at it at first. First, you need big muscles to do it, and you're going to be inefficient at first. So by fledging at a higher mass, it gives you a buffer to lose weight if you're inefficient before you get to the adult mass. So it's kind of an insurance policy, a developmental insurance policy. Curbill thrasher, a ground forager, that's not a big deal. Um, you, you want to get out, out of those uh, lower nests uh, in shrubs or on the ground. Um, uh, if you're a ground forager, remember, because those are the ones that are, have the highest predation rates. So get out of dodge as quickly as you can, even if you're relatively light. If you're just foraging, picking up uh, insects or um, seeds on the ground, that's a lot easier to do. And you don't need that buffer like an aerial insectivore would. So clearly, um, bioprenalic area is really important in altricial young. Precocial young, though, do need some uh, care. So if it's really cold, they may need some brooding. If it's really hot, they may need some shading, as seen in this gull here. They sometimes don't have very efficient reactions to predators, and so uh, they can learn what the predator threats are, and the parents can provide some protection against predators. So these sun grebes here are riding on uh, mom's back. Uh, and actually, this is a species where the a uh, parent can actually carry uh, them for short distances in flight to protect them, uh, to help them escape a, a predatory situation. And another thing that another form of parental care that precocial species will do is they'll just kind of hang around their parent um, to learn appropriate food, foods to eat or appropriate uh, microhabitats or habitats in which to forage. So there can be some increased uh, um, cap foraging capabilities, not by actually getting the food directly from the parents, but learning how to be a better forager. Okay, so that's the first part of this. Uh, we'll pick up uh, talking about more parental uh, behaviors in the next lecture.